everyone. Happy Palm Sunday. Would you join in the call to worship printed in your bulletins? Joining our voices together, God of arrivals, help us to hear a call at the gates, not to greatness or grandiosity, not to position or prominence, but to the deepest call of all, love, creativity, and justice. May us through the laws and of our lives. And may we be faithful to love, creativity, and justice as you were. Come and let us worship God. Would you now join me in prayer? Living Christ, you have come to us not on a majestic steed, but on a lowly and humble animal. You come to us not in the grand procession of kings and emperors, but along a dusty trail where peasants waved palms in recognition. You were then, and you are now, the donkey king. You continue to enter the world in similar ways, foolish, ironic, and startling. You enter our lives not in glory, but on the back roads of our lives, in the humble places of our hearts, on the donkeys, those lowly events that make up the bulk of our days. Help us to open the way to you with palms. And may we have the wisdom to keep on following you, even when the hosannas have been quieted. Living Christ, Donkey King, teach us to pray. And this of all weeks, as you once taught your disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning once again to all of you, and welcome to this Palm Sunday morning at the First Congregational Church of Old Lyme. Whether you are new to this place or whether you've been a part of things around here for decades, we are grateful to be able to mark the beginning of Holy Week with each and every one of you on this Palm Sunday. Last night, many of our youth gathered to think about the realities of homelessness and about the very thin line that separates the housed from the unhoused in our world. As those torrents of rain were falling last night, I was thinking of them all and hoping that they had taken shelter somewhere inside the church walls here. I think they did. We'll be hearing from them just a little bit later, but the storm seemed like the perfect object lesson for what it means to be in need of permanent shelter and to be unable to find it. It's also a good reminder of the role that churches themselves can and should play in that search for shelter. And so to all of the young people and to all of the adults who were here last night and who participated in those events, we are grateful for your willingness to think and to learn and to feel, and we're grateful for your willingness to share some of what you learned with us this morning. As for the coming week, we're going to try to keep things fairly quiet until Thursday, which we call Monday Thursday. On that evening, those who wish will gather here in the meeting house for a service of readings and of sacred music and of Holy Communion, which will begin at 6 o'clock. That service will conclude in time for us to begin the next part of our evening, which will never end. <laughs> it will end, but just not that evening. It'll end the following morning. Um, 
What I'm talking about is the complete reading of Dante's Purgatorio, which will begin at 7 p.m. This is the second part of a three-year cycle in which we are immersing ourselves in this sacred poem whose action begins on Maundy Thursday and which concludes on Easter Sunday. This is an admittedly loopy and gonzo literary and theological experiment that I've got us conducting in which we are all invited to experience one of the monumental achievements of human culture and to sense how it speaks to our condition here and now in the 21st century. Believe it or not, this is meant to be fun. But it's also meant to do something to us and within us and among us as we submit ourselves to these words and images. In a way, this is the antithesis of our online digital culture. This night is going to require our attention. It's going to require our stillness. It's going to require our patience. And it's going to ask for a different part of our minds and our spirits than we usually have occasion to access. I mean this to be a contemplative moment. So I hope that you'll come. I hope that you'll be a part even just of a little part of it. We have 34 different readers, each with their own interpretations and inflections. We will take breaks, we'll have coffee, we'll have snacks. You can lay yourself out on one of the pews or under the pews. We might find you at the end and wake you up or we might not. Anyway, I think this poem has the power to draw us closer to God. It has done so for me, and I wonder if it might have a similar effect on some of you. And so I invite you to be a part of it. On Good Friday, the meeting house will be open for prayer and for meditation. Saturday will be quiet. After that, Easter Sunday shall begin, starting at 6.15 a.m. with a beautiful sunrise service at Griswold Point. It's going to be cold, but it will also be beautiful. We will, after that, have two services here in the meeting house, one at 9 and one at 11. Between the services, the choir will be providing a breakfast for us all in the fellowship hall. Thank you in advance to all of you for that. I know it's a heavy lift for all of you that morning, but know that we appreciate your service and your hospitality. Um, so at 10 o'clock, that, that breakfast will be happening, and I invite you to join us for that. It's going to be a wonderful morning all in all, but really it's going to be a wonderful week, and I do hope you'll be a part of it. Before moving on to the rest of our service, let me take this opportunity to thank our deacons who are helping this morning as well as our ushers. We are grateful for our Sunday school teachers and for all of those who will be sharing with us later this morning. We're thankful for our tech operator upstairs and we're grateful for that there are those who are watching our service from afar. It's good to be with you even at a distance. We're, for that, we're thankful for those who have helped to prepare the fellowship hour today, that all of us might enjoy visiting with one another after the service. We're grateful to all of those folks. But I also want you to know that I, that we, are grateful for each and every one of you, for your presence here today and in the ongoing life of our community. I'm glad, we're glad that you're here with us. It's good to be together in this place, doing what we do week by week. Would you now um, join in singing hymn number 366, We Are Walking in the Light of God, as the children parade with palms. Yes. Sorry, we have a... First. First, and then the We Are Walking happens oh. as the parade of palms. Okay, so children's message first. <laughs> children's message first. Uh, so those children, young people in the congregation who would like to come forward, please do so now. Uh, after that, we'll parade and we'll sing. Okay.
So a minute, you'll get to hear the choir pretend that they are the crowd welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem. They are, really. Howard Thurman, famous mentor of Dr. Martin Luther King, said, to love is to make of one's heart a swinging door. May love grow as we share for care for one another and keep our hearts open and the church doors open wide. The morning offering will now be received. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. 
Well, actually, you could stand again and sing 503. It's a little sort of exercise program we have here. We sit and we stand and we sit. 503. find stories about the last days that Jesus spent with his disciples before that final heart-wrenching journey, journey into Jerusalem. After telling his friends what they were about to witness and how they would need to hold fast to what they believed in, he lifted his eyes toward heaven and said a prayer for the disciples. I will no longer be in the world, he says to the Father, but they will be in the world. I do not pray for you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe. I pray that they would be consecrated by the truth. Every time I read those words, I imagine that Jesus says them also to you and to me. We are in the world, and the world is often a confusing and confounding place, but we are called to consecrate ourselves to the truth. Would you join me in prayer? God of all creation, who led us out into the world this morning to hear bird song after a night of rain, who leads us daily past green meadows and still water and feeds us with the bounty of the land and restores us with nature's glory. Lead us now deeper into the peace of this house of meeting. 
and stay here beside us in all our prayers so that we may know a peace that the world cannot give. Let it be that here this morning, now, we open our hearts and minds to this new day and to whatever new understandings we can take from this place of worship and fellowship and restoration. We lay before you a ragged tapestry of the hurts and injuries of so many of your beloved children across this broad world you so loved. We pray for the people the world over who have left their homes as refugees, driven out by fear of persecution or the turmoil of war or the degradation of a changing climate. We pray for people whose lives have been ravaged by poverty, who live in need of food or shelter. We pray for those who spend every day in the shadow of war and violence in Haiti, in Gaza, in Ukraine, in Congo. We pray for those who know the deep and relentless loneliness of grief, who face an empty chair at the dinner table and yearn for the presence of one they love. We pray for those who struggle against illness of the mind or body or soul. And we pray for all those who every day battle against the strong undertow of addictions. And we pray for ourselves, Lord of mercy, for we do and we must live in this world each and every day. We must live among the challenges amidst the brokenness, struggling to do our best. Consecrate us with the spirit of truth, we pray. Enable us to hear your voice of wisdom coming to us from a deep, deep well of mercy and grace. And grant that we might be both patient with ourselves, understanding our inevitable shortcomings, but also courageous and strong as we seek to do whatever we can do to bring your peace and healing to the world. Grant to us determination and resilience and a measure of joy in each day, for it is joy that sustains us in trial. Help us to know restoration of the body and soul in the laughter of a child or the taste of good food or the warmth of an evening fire. Help us to claim each moment of joy and pause to give thee thanks. And then, Lord of mercy, turn us toward our own Jerusalems, our own trials, our own challenges and burdens, and let us hear clearly your voice, the deep and ageless voice of truth that guides us on. Consecrate us with the truth, as if your word and your truth could be our armor as we move about in and through this world. Help us to feel and hear the crowds of people, our friends and champions, who stand along the roadside urging us on with hosannas, assuring us that we are not alone. Hear this and all our prayers in the name of Jesus the Christ, who made that triumphal journey into Jerusalem so that we also might know courage and strength and truth. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we say hosanna and amen. Psalm 118, 19 to 24. 
Open the gates of justice. I will enter and tell the Lord how thankful I am. Here is the gate of the Lord. Everyone who does right may enter this gate. I praise the Lord for answering my prayers and saving me. The stone that builders tossed aside has now become the most important stone. The Lord has done this, and it is amazing to us. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's celebrate and be glad today. Uh, this is a scripture from Mark. When they were approaching Jerusalem, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing in tying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. When they brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their they threw their cloaks close on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who were followed, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who came in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem and went to the temple, and when he looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Last night, as you know by now, was our Sharing Humanity Night. I drove to the New London Hospitality Center in pelting rain to pick up our guest speaker. Her name is Catherine. Church member Dana Dixon had connected us, and over the phone earlier in the week, she said to me, you can't miss me when you come to pick me up. I'll be the brunette with a cane. Pulling into the parking lot towards the entrance of the center, I decided to walk over to the front door and passed a large tent where many guests were waiting under cover of the tent with all of their belongings. It was wet, cold, and quite smoky. I rang the buzzer and was led into the front door. Catherine was putting her coat on and greeted me warmly with a, are you ready for me? Our sharing humanity night was supposed to be outside, and we obviously, we ended up sleeping inside. So teenagers and adults shared some pizza and gathered around tables in our fellowship hall. Catherine led us into her life, into the challenges and the resiliency that, have, that make up her story. Decades of addiction, time in and out of York prison, medical challenges, inability to manage work and keep up her apartment, loss of her beloved, recovery programs, and in recent days, a temporary room at the center and a brighter future. The life of Catherine, as we discovered together, is an ongoing gospel story. And for a little while, we were all a part of that story, too. In preparation for our meeting up, I was thinking of that moment in the very beginning when people who don't know each other start to reveal themselves. We're blank canvases at first, and most of the time just remain stereotypes and stigmas seen from a distance another homeless person with bags on the sidewalk, or a sullen teenager in the corner. And then, once a real conversation unfolds, a sacred conversation, the truth of who one is can emerge, and our humanness is bridged, the person themselves becomes enfleshed 
in the very real. And that is a holy moment. I think that's some of what we experienced last night. And in a few minutes, you'll hear from some of our middle and high school students about their perspective, about what has stayed with them, and how we share humanity in a way that we can care for one another and take care of each other, especially someone whose home is in their car or in a temporary shelter. We reminded one another last night, too, of what Jesus taught his community at his time, that whenever we are with one another, feed one another, clothe one another, take the time to visit with each other, respect one another, we are being Jesus. We are being with Jesus. We are, in fact, changing the world from a stark, damp place into a hopeful one of kindness and kinship. The contemporary poet Christian Wyman, in his new book called Zero at the Bone, has a chapter entitled Joy, Help, Joy, Help, Joy, Help. That, to me, is the story of Palm Sunday at those opening gates where we met Jesus in the Gospel of Mark today. The exuberant entry of Jesus into his city marks the beginning of this holy, unholy week. It is a crucible moment at the eastern gate. What unfolds as the week progresses is a blend of tragedy and triumph, joy and cruelty that inspires, provokes, and challenges us if we let the stories in to co-mingle with our own. There is joy, yes, and also the need for much help. This morning, after we've shared our reflections, everyone will have a chance to come forward, get a palm branch if you haven't received one yet, and we'll head outdoors, make a circle, and lift up our own hosannas, which people shout to Jesus as he goes by. And hosanna actually means save now, save please. Save now, save please. These are the cries heard around the world today, in Gaza, in Haiti, to those seeking a safe place to sleep here in Connecticut. This humble gospel parade you can find in all four of the gospels, and they're told in all four different ways. The writers all have parts they emphasize, like four different paintings of the same subject. In a little bit, we're going to have some of our young people come forward and share their perspective, and each one will tell a different story about last night. The Palm Sunday Parade is, in fact, a piece of street theater, a political protest dramatizing an ancient prophecy that this long-awaited divine monarch will arrive on a humble animal, a donkey, announcing peace, peace to the nations, as it says in the prophecy of Zechariah. Now, if you're interested in learning a little bit more, I would recommend Professor Amy Jill Levine's book called Passion Week, about what unfolds this week. Jill Levine is very good at clarifying biblical myths, highlighting some questions, and lifting up the ways contemporary readers miss what was true about the Jewish community back then and what was not. The misreadings by the Christian church over the centuries has led to wrong, persistent, and even dangerous theologies and stereotypes. Those in the Jerusalem of Jesus' day were living under occupation, as many people today around the world are. Standing at that opening gate, Jesus knew that things were about to get more difficult. He knew, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. must have known, as Alexei Navalny said he knew that death was imminent. As people of faith, as followers of this old story, mingling it with our own, 
we know that death doesn't have the final word. Only love does. Soon enough, this humble parade turns into the passion narratives and shouts of crucify him. But for now, what are you seeing and hearing in this moment in your life and in the light of, of our congregation? How might we enter into the gospel stories we read and share together in a more meaningful way this year? What speaks to you or what doesn't? As you know, we'll mark Monday, Thursday and keep making our way forward to Easter. With that as a backdrop, I'd like to invite up some of our student reflectors of their experience last night, starting with Miles, Ace, Zoe, and Ellison. <laughs> If you're ready. <laughs> so I think we all took a lot from that last night. It was kind of like an emotional experience with the stories that we heard. But one of the things, oh, one of the things I really took away from it was when we, when we settled down for the night and tried to sleep, it was, it was actually very hard to sleep because we were just in a very unfamiliar environment with people that you weren't like really close to. And it was, it was really hard to, like, to settle down because there was noises and like, you didn't know, it was, like, it was tough. But you see that just having a nice bed and having a stuff can really just help you persevere and it's a nice way instead of living out like, on the streets, but being inside of a shelter can really help, on, especially on stormy nights like the one we had. And it was just, it was a super cool experience to be able to understand it and hear the story of the person that we had. Hello. So the way that I'm reflecting on last night's um, sharing humanity sleeping experience is how difficult and scary it can be um, at night to sleep. And in the night, there are many noises and distractions that keep you up at night. And I also experienced how it can be dark and scary when getting up to use the restroom or to get up and stretch. I feel that if I was put in a homeless person's shoes, it would be a little bit uncomfortable and unsettling to get up or sleep during the night. I also think that it would be um, um, different. Oh, I'm sorry. I also think that it would be difficult um, to get a full night's sleep in a like shelter because of all the noise and distractions. Thank you. Last night, I got the opportunity to participate in Sharing Humanity Night. The night started off by us getting the chance to hear from Miss Catherine, a homeless woman. She told us her story from alcoholism, near-death experiences, loss, and mental illness. Miss um, Catherine has lived it all. When I first met Miss Catherine, I didn't know she was the guest speaker who had been through so much. I first talked to her about the weather and living in, living in Connecticut. After we all gathered and she told us her life, she later asked me a question, did my story scare you? I told her no, that it was powerful to hear about what she's lived through, but truthfully, it was scary. It was scary to think about how somebody could live through all the things Miss Catherine did. It was scary that when she left, Miss Laura wasn't driving her home, but instead to a homeless hospitality center 20 minutes from here. Miss Catherine taught me a lot, but perhaps the most important thing is that you never know what someone has been through and you never know what your own future holds, so be kind to everyone. Um, good morning, I'm Ellis Lodge, and last night I went to Box Night or Sharing Humanity here at FCCOL. Um, Box Night is when we put ourselves in homeless people's shoes and sleep outside, but we slept inside this year because it was pouring rain outside. Then we had a guest come in that actually had gone through everything while being homeless. Um, I thought meeting someone who had gone through being homeless was a very moving experience. Um, I was very deep in thought while Kathy, our guest, was talking about tragic experiences of hers. 
Um, while we talked to Kathy, we packed bags of toiletries for the homeless to be donated, and we put encouraging notes inside of them with quotes that will hopefully help lift their day up. Um, I think I'm taking away from. Okay. Um, I think I'm taking away from this that that we don't know how lucky we are, and that we should always be grateful. I hold on. Okay, and then that we should always be grateful for what we do have and not what we don't have. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anna Bjornberg, and last night we did Box Night. Box Night is where we put ourselves into a homeless person's shoes. To do this, we usually sleep in boxes and tents on the church lawn, but this year it was pouring out, so we decided to sleep in the church in sleeping bags. Every, every year, Box Night teaches me to be grateful for what I have. Even though this makeshift experience can never fully compare to the real thing, Box Night never fails to remind me how homeless people make so much out of so little. Um, so last night, uh, during Sharing Humanity Night, which is where we stay outside and put ourselves in um, a homeless person's perspective, uh, this year we stayed inside because it was raining. Um, and I learned that many people do not have a lot of the things that we take for granted, like uh, maybe a toothbrush. Uh, or like uh, clean clothes and so um, uh, also last night I found out that um, it also might be hard to find like a good comfortable area where it's quiet and uh, nice to sleep um, and I think the main idea of Box Night is that we should be thankful for what we have and not take everything for granted because not everyone gets what we get. Last night I was able to participate in um, Sharing Humanity Night and I'm so used to really sleeping by myself, kind of in my own little bubble, but last night I had a hard time sleeping and at one point at, in the night I looked over, I looked around and I saw most of the other people thinking the same things and it was at that point when I realized what sharing humanities m meant and that it wasn't just like, like being there physically together, but it was being there and experiencing it together. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Phineas Hamilton Barrett and last night I learned a couple things and one of those things was to have a new perspective on like how I viewed everything and I think the best way to wait, I think the best way to put this is the difference between isolation and privacy because at first I picked this area of the, the room that was like guarded off like, like by boxes and I was like literally like away from everyone and that wasn't very fun, you know what I mean? I was just sitting there away from everyone 
And I learned that 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 wasn't like that wasn't very fun. And I wanted to go hang out with everyone else. So I eventually moved my space into like more of like you know a common area where everyone else was. And I had a, a much better time, and I had a much better experience, and it helped me, you know, relax and get to sleep easier. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Gabby Clark, and I wanted to share my experience doing the Sharing Humanity Night. This was my second year doing this, and when this year's visitor, Catherine, came to visit us, she changed my perspective on homelessness, specifically taking things for granted. After she explained her whole story, we explained how we're making some care bags that include some basic hygiene items. For example, like soap, toothbrushes, toothpaste are all things we're putting in these bags. And then she started crying and she was explaining how all these donations are used and appreciated and how important these are. And I always knew that these donations helped people, but these small hygiene products have an impact on so many people and she helped me to change my perspective on how not everyone has these items that we like take for granted and use every day. Thank you for letting us share our experiences. Um, good morning, I'm Clarissa Mock and last night I participated in my first Sharing Humanitarian Night. So over the past night, we were able to gather a deeper understanding of what it's like to be houseless. After listening to Catherine's story, we were shown how many different causes can leave someone without a house and a home. Once we learned about the hardships that many people face, we put together bags of necessities that people would need, like toothbrushes, toothpaste, deodorant, and other hygiene project, products. We also added some handwritten um, notes for every single bag for the people who were receiving the bags to see. We finished the night by watching a movie about a civil rights in order to prepare for the um, April trip in two weeks. Overall, the past night has been an eye-opening experience that has taught us about homelessness and being homeless. Well, I wanna thank all our young people that participated last night, those who spoke and those who were with us. Um, but thank you for those of you who reflected your experience, Miles and Ace and Zoe and Ellison and Anna, B and Noah and Henry and Finn and Gabby and Clarissa, thank you. I also want to thank Jolene Brandt, our coordinator extraordinaire of Sunday School and Youth Programming. Jolene, thank you. Um, also, chaperones Angela Mock, Kathy Sugland, uh, and from a Higgin, the Higginham Church, Amy Barlow, Ross Higgins came and shared more information with us about um, homelessness in Connecticut. Thank you for helping us with the big picture. Uh, Bill Beluzzi came and made salad for us at the 11th hour, right before we ate pizza. Thank you to you, Dana Dixon. Thank you for connecting us with our new friend, Catherine. Mostly, I want our young people to know uh, that we're pretty impressed by you, that you would dare to spend a Saturday night in church and help us be the change in the world and remind us of that. Um, one of the things I heard Catherine share in her story last night was that at one point, there was nobody else that she could go to. So she was sleeping under a bridge for months on end. She had no one else to go to. Often people who find themselves unhoused, their family, their friends often are in similar situations and not able to help. So I just want you to look around at all the people who are here that are part of our community. So you will know that you will always have a community around you and people you can go to no matter what. 
the more that we can offer one another ways of seeing justice and injustice through the gospel according to Catherine and according to one another and according to the gospel writers, the more we can help one another meet the need, change the system, lift up voices who haven't been heard, and honor one another's humanity and divinity. Thank you all for helping us with some of that last night and into today. Amen. Now, as it's Palm Sunday, uh, in just a minute, we're gonna, when the organ starts, uh, Simon will uh, help us kick off our final hymn. And people are invited, especially on the center aisle, to come up, uh, get your palms, and we are gonna go outside into the freezing cold sunshine and lift our voices in the air and, and share our hosannas three times. How does that sound? And, and maybe our um, youth will help us give out palms as well. Okay, here we go. Thank you. 